This meeting is being recorded. Okay. So this chapter where you and I left off, we left off at the end of chapter 14. So this is chapter 15, the yoga of the Supreme person. Okay, Alan is here. Alan was at the Bhagavad Dharma discourses in New Vrindavan. Oh, great. Hey, Alan, can you hear me? Oh, he's, he's connecting right now. Hey, Alan. Alan, there you are. Can you hear me? Yeah, one moment. I can't wait to be able to make a, a boing sound with the Murdanga. I think that's going to hey, be Alan. Hello. Hello. This is Melissa. Nice to meet this you. This is a part of our Kirtan Center. She has a beautiful voice. Oh, thanks. Extremely powerful voice. It'll blow you away when she's leading Kirtan it if you come to the Kirtan Center here in Pittsburgh. <laughs> she's going to be teaching Murdanga lessons. I'm oh. going to be taking redundant taking lessons. lessons and then eventually teach. because <laughs> first you have to learn and then you become a teacher. So we're, can you see the screen there, Alan? Yes. Yoga, the Supreme person. That's where we're starting. Yeah. There was one other person who was going to join, uh, but we're just going to go ahead and start. So uh, the way this works is uh, I'm going to read the Sanskrit and the translation and are the synonyms in the translation and then uh you guys can take turns reading we'll take turns reading the uh paragraphs okay does that sound good oh yeah is it, it, that sounds good okay okay chapter 15 yoga of the supreme person text one sri bhagavan avacha urva mula mada shakam ashtam pararabhyam shandam siyasiparnani Yes, Tam Veda Savedavit. Synonyms. Sri Bhagavan Avacha, the Supreme Personality of God, had said, Urdva Mulam, with roots above, Ada, downwards, Shakam, branches, Ashratam, a banyan tree, Prahu, it is, is said, Aviyam, eternal, Chandamsi, the Vedic hymns, Yasya, of which Pranani, the leaves, yeah, anyone who, Tam, that Veda knows, Sa, he, Veda, Vit, knower of the Vedas. Translation, the Supreme Personality of God had said, it is said that there is an imperishable banyan tree that has its roots upward and its branches down and whose leaves are the Vedic hymns. Who knows this tree is the knower of the Vedas. Um, you wanna start out, Melissa? Uh, after the discussion of the importance of bhakti yoga, one may question, what about the Vedas? It is explained in this chapter that the purpose of Vedic study is to understand Krishna. Therefore, one who is in Krishna consciousness, who is engaged in devotional service, already knows the Vedas. The entanglement of this material world is compared to a banyan tree. For one who is engaged in fruitive activities, there is no end to the banyan tree. He wanders from one branch to another, to another, uh, the tree of this material world has no end for one who is attached to this tree. There is no possibility of liberation. The Vedic hymns meant for elevating oneself are called the leaves of this tree. This tree's roots grow upward because they begin from where Brahma is located, the topmost planet of this universe. If one can understand this indestructible tree of illusion, one can get out of it. This process of extriction, or sorry, extrication should be understood. In the previous chapters, it has been explained that there are many processes by which to get out of the material entanglements. And up to the 13th chapter, we have seen that devotional service to the Supreme Lord is the best way. Now the basic pr principle of devotional service is detachment from material activities and attachment to the transcendental service of the Lord. The process of breaking attachment to the material world is discussed in the beginning of this chapter. The root of this material experience grows upward. 
this means that it begins from the total material substance, from the topmost planet of the universe. From there, the whole universe is expanded with so many branches representing the various planetary systems. The fruits represent the results of the living entities' activities, namely religion, uh, economic development, sense gratification, and liberation. Melissa, can I now, stop you there? I'm going to let him, I, this is a long pair of purport. So can you, do you want to read, Alan? Starting with this paragraph here. Now, mm -hmm. there is no ready experience. Now there is no ready experience in this world of a tree situated when its branches down and its roots upward. But there is such a thing. The tree can be found besides a reservoir of water. We can see that the trees of the bank reflect upon the water with their branches down and roots up. In other words, the tree of this material world is only a reflection of the real tree of the spiritual world. The reflection of the spiritual world is situated on desire, just as the tree's reflection is situated on water. Desire is the cause of things being situated in any reflective material light. One who wants to get out of this material existence must know this tree thoroughly, though analytical study. Then he can cut off his relationships with it. Why don't you go ahead and read the last paragraph there, Alan. The tree being the reflection of the real tree is an extra replica. Exactly. Everything is there in the spiritual world. The impersonalists take Brahman to be the root of this material tree and from the root, according to Sankhya philosophy, Come, prak, ti, hu, ru, sa, then the three gunas, then the five gross elements, pa, ka, ma, pa, buta, then the ten senses, da, sen, dry, ya, mind, etc. In this way, they divide up the whole material world into 24 elements. If Brahman is the center of all manifestations, then this material world is a manifestation of the center by 180 degrees and the other 180, 180 degrees constitutes the spiritual world. The material is the perverted reflection. So the spiritual world must have the same very goodness -ness, but in reality the pra he is the external energy of the Supreme Lord, and the Purusa is the Supreme Lord himself, and that is explained in Bhagavad Gita. Since this manifestation is material, it is temporary. Reflection of, is temporary, for it is sometimes seen and sometimes not seen. But the origin from whence the reflection is reflected is eternal. The maternal the material reflection of the real tree has to be cut off. When it is said that a tr person knows the Vedas, it is assumed that he knows how to cut off attachment to this material world. If one knows the, that process, he actually knows the Vedas. One who is attracted by the ritualistic formulas of the Vedas is attracted by the beautiful green leaves of the tree. He does not exactly know the purpose of the Vedas, the purpose of the Vedas are disclosed by the personality of Godhead himself is to cut down this reflected tree and attain the real tree of the spiritual world. Yeah, I was thinking about this. By the way, some of these Sanskrit terms like Purusha means the supreme enjoyer and Prakriti is the external energy of the Lord. That is uh, the material energy from which this material universe is expanded. And Purusha is the, is the enjoyer. We're all Purushas enjoying living entities, but Krishna is the supreme enjoyer. <clears throat> but anyway, um, I was thinking about this one, 40, 45 years ago or so, when I first came to New Vrindavan, I was walking around the hills of New Vrindavan like we were at that hill at Bhagavad Dharma Discourse, Alan, yeah. on the top of the hill. I was like wandering around and I was thinking, you know, I got the realization kind of like an epiphany that when I, uh, before I came to Krishna consciousness, 
you know, I was thinking that I was the, like the center of the universe. You know, you're looking at yourself as the enjoyer and that you're attached to the things of this material world. But actually, it's not really the case. It's like a reflection. It's like the perverted reflection of the spiritual world. Actually, if you understand that Krishna is the enjoyer, then the mirror flips around and you see reality. It's like, oh, wait, I'm not the center of the universe. Krishna is the center of the universe. And that blew my mind. I still remember it. Of course, it took like decades to, to actually try to practice that and put it into, into um, you know, practice. I'm still practicing, you know. It's like when I was listening, I was bringing back something from the store and uh and I, on the way, I was listening to some instrumental music, and I was thinking, you know, like, I'm, I know this isn't sense gratification, but how to listen to this music so that I'm not attached to it, but that I can still, you know, listen to it in a Krishna conscious way. And you, you chant the mantra, mantra is in 4-4 four, four time, because it's 16 syllables. And then when you chant the mantra, you hear it in, in, in conjunction with the music, you can do that. There's no hard and fast rules for chanting. But I was thinking... It's not my enjoyment that's important. It's Krishna's enjoyment. So if you can hear the name, Krishna wants us to do that. He also wants us to spread this message that he's giving us to others. And so when we're enthusiastic to do that, no matter what we do, um, if we're enthusiastic in our endeavors and do it on behalf of Krishna, knowing that it's not our endeavor, it's actually Krishna, we're, he's giving the, us the impetus to uh, execute these uh, various services. We are eternal servants of Krishna, and if we can engage in that service, somehow or other, based on what we've heard from these books, and based on the chanting of the mantra, Krishna is in his mantra. And so when we understand what Krishna wants, then we'll be able to be enthusiastic in serving him the way he desires. And then we can be enthusiastic. The word enthusiasm is kind of interesting. I looked it up. Um, enthusiasm, the root etymological meaning of that word is an theos, enthusiasm. Theos means God. So it's like inspired by God. So that's the root meaning of enthusiasm. So I, Emerson, I used to read Emerson when I was in high school, and he said, nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. So we have to be enthusiastic in our service and let Krishna take over and whatever, you know, Krishna will let you know if he's, if he's pleased with your activities, but the whole idea is to en endeavor to do everything for him, whatever we do, whatever we eat, whatever we offer, give away, whatever austerities we perform, we should do as an offering to him. And then he guides us from within our heart and the scriptures and the spiritual master from without Will, will tell us and confirm that this is what Krishna wants us to do. And then we're free to act. And we can do it with all enthusiasm without any kind of fear of deviating from the path, you know? So that's what it means by seeing the other, uh, the other side of the mirror. When we see that Krishna is a center and we're working for him, then we can actually um, be totally free and uh, be very enthusiastic to do whatever Krishna wants us to do and uh, not do whatever Krishna doesn't want us to do. You know, like we'll, even though we might want to do something, we'll look at it as, you know, the sons of Krishna. Yeah. He had lots of sons, but he, one of his main sons from Rukmini, if he wanted to do something that Krishna didn't look, want him to do that, then he looked at it, that as poison. He wouldn't even think of doing it. But if Krishna wanted him, if Krishna didn't want him to do something, you know, if he wanted him to do something and he didn't want to, then he would do it with all enthusiasm. So that's the way we have to, to look at everything. What does Krishna want us to do? What would, would uh, you know, what is the will of Krishna, you know? So that is the, the path of Krishna consciousness. And by serving Krishna in that way, Krishna reveals himself when he's pleased. The purpose of the Vedas is to please Krishna. That is the purpose of life. When Krishna is pleased, there's nothing more to be said. Of course, the ultimate goal is to love Krishna, and Krishna wants our love, and that's he, he doesn't want our offerings. He could do anything, but he wants the love by which it's 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 offered. Okay, let's let's go on to text two. We I don't have a question. Have, what's that? Um so it says that 
someone who is already engaged in devotional service yeah. already knows the Vedas. Like, what do they mean by that? Somebody's engaged. Well, see, it's there's two tracks on the train to the spiritual world. There's Guru and Krishna. When we're surrendered to Guru and Krishna, there are two personalities. One, you can't have one without the other. The Guru is the external manifestation of Krishna, and then Krishna is in our hearts, in the spirit, in the uh, guiding us when within but krishna is a personality and when we uh, both have faith in both the spiritual master and krishna then all the vedic wisdom is automatically revealed within our hearts you don't have to learn anything you know you can know these verses but these verses the meaning of them are revealed from within the heart these are aphorisms all these sanskrit words have a ton of meaning behind them Prabhupada's spiritual master just read the first verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam, and he spent one month explaining every single word of that, that verse. So there's, there's a ton of meaning behind these words because Krishna is unlimited, and you can read them thousands of times, and they become ever fresh, and there's always a new meaning coming out of them. So that's the way it works. Uh, if you, one who knew, has faith in the spiritual master and Krishna, all the imports of the Vedic knowledge are revealed from within the heart. Does that make sense? Well, I guess what I'm wondering in like a more direct way, are they saying that like one would only engage in devotional service if they had already heard the Vedas, like they're doing devotional service because they heard the Vedas or they just kind of absorb the Vedas because no, it, it doesn't have anything to do with learning anything. Krishna reveals himself when he's pleased with a devotee. The whole, uh, the whole, he reveals the Veda. He is the Vedas. He's the, he's the author of the Vedas, and he is the, um, he's the the preceptor. Nobody else can write any religious scripture. It comes from God and only God. And he's the. Uh, it says in the Veda. It says in the Bhagavad Gita. It says. Vedanta vit Veda Krit Eva Saham. I am the Vedas and I compiled the Vedas and I am the knower of the Vedas. So Krishna reveals the Vedas from within the heart of a devotee who surrenders to him. And there is a connection there. You know, it, you know that, you know, it, it's true because you can see through these words, there's different meanings that are coming not from our own mind, our senses. They're, they're not something that was just made up by somebody. It's actually coming from the spiritual world. And so, therefore, uh, when Krishna reveals himself to you, when he's pleased with our service and surrender and humility, and we, you know, we, we approach a spiritual master or a devotee, and we try to inquire submissively and render service, and then he can impart knowledge to you because he has seen the truth. He's already on the path. He, Krishna is pleased with him. And then when he wants to show somebody Krishna consciousness, he can show you who Krishna is, and Krishna will say, okay, well, you know, uh, you are wanting me to make this devotee Krishna conscious, so I'll accept him on your behalf. So a devotee is very powerful. He's even more powerful than Krishna. Krishna is controlled by his devotees. He doesn't do anything besides what the devotees want, and devotees don't do anything besides what Krishna wants. It's like a reciprocal thing. And so it's more and more beautiful because the love is just, they try to do themselves. It's like a transcendental competition, you know? So um, that is the uh, ever increasing ocean of transcendental bliss, that there is unlimited pleasure, ananda and love in the spiritual world because Krishna is always reciprocating with his devotees and the devotees are always searching for more and more ways to serve Krishna. And it's a, it's a reciprocal relationship. It's a personal relationship. And uh, as long as we're in line with what Krishna wants us to do, Krishna will reveal more and more. He can empower anyone to do anything. Uh, you know, so if we're engaged in his service, we can do anything. There's no, the Prabhupada said that the word impossible is not in a, the, the Vodhi's dictionary because he can move mountains. So uh, anyway, um, you want to, I'll just read this translation. The branches of this tree extend downward and upward, nourished by the three modes of material nature. The twigs are the objects of the senses. The tree also has roots going down, and these are bound 
to the fruit of actions of human society. Fruit of actions means like you, you do something, you work for, in order to enjoy the money, which you, you know, employ to, to make your senses happy. You know, you want to see sounds and sights and movies and ball games and concerts and stuff like that. That's a fruit of activity. But when we're working for Krishna, we're working for him. And the whole goal of uh, Krishna consciousness is to please Krishna's senses, not our own senses. Uh, if you have any um, comments or questions, Alan, feel free to, to jump in at any time. Why don't you go ahead and read the purport, um, uh, just the first paragraph. We'll take turns reading paragraphs, Melissa. Read the first Are you paragraph. in Pittsburgh, Alan? Or do you want to you wanna read, yes, Alan? Uh, yeah, I'll read, but yes, I'm in Pittsburgh, but when I'm done reading, I, ha I, I have my Veda's book and I had something to elaborate on the question she was asking, but I'll read this. Yeah. The description of the banyan tree is further explained here. Its branches spread in all directions. In the lower parts, there are variegated manifestations of living entities, human beings, animals, horses, cows, dogs, cats, and etc. These are situated on the lower parts of the branches, whereas on the upper part parts are higher forms of living entities, the demigods, Gandharvas, and many other higher species of life. As a tree is nourished by water, so this tree is nourished by the three modes of material nature. Sometimes we find that a tract of land is barren for what of sufficient water and sometimes a tract is very green similarly where particular modes of mate material nature are proportionally greater in quantity the different species of life are manifested accordingly why don't you share that that what you were reading what is that book the vedas i have one myself and then and this is my bhagavad gita but uh, it's right uh, yeah that's Prabhupada's gita what, yeah, who wrote this vedas book uh, it's translated by it's by somebody else called Ralph T. Griffith because I couldn't find one on Prabhupada, but this made kind of sense. It says, well, this one's according to Orthodox, but it says, according to Orthodox views of Indian theologians, not a single line of the Vedas was a work of human authors. The right. whole Vedas is a same is some way or other the work of the deity, which I feel like you mentioned Krishna. And even yeah. those who received the revelation, or as they expressed it, those who saw it were not supposed to be ordinary mortals, but beings raised above the level of common humanity and less liable, therefore, to err in the reception of revealed truth. That is more, but it's going, I can't. Yeah, well, see, that's, that's the, that, see, there's two kinds of Vedas. The Vedas are either spoken by Krishna himself, that's the Bhagavad Gita. The song of God, and then there's stuff that's spoken about Krishna, and the Bhagavatam, the Srimad Bhagavatam, the other great literature that Prabhupada spent his life uh, translating uh, and making purports to. Uh, that was spoken, uh, and by most of the rest of the Vedas was spoken by Vyasadeva and written down, uh, and um, Vyasadeva spoke about Krishna. Uh, and he was actually an incarnation, a literary incarnation of God himself. So he, like it said there, there is no possibility for him making a mistake. The living, ordinary living entities have four defects. They, uh, they have imperfect senses. You can't see everything in the universe. You have a tendency to make mistakes and you're an illusion sometimes. And then you have a cheating propensity. But these people that write the Vedas, like Vyasadeva, and the people that speak it, like his son, Shukadev Goswami, they are above all these four different faults because they're directly in touch with this knowledge that comes from the spiritual world. Like, for example, and they know past, present, and future. Like Vyasadeva uh, predicted exactly the, all the incarnations of Godhead are mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam, including Lord Buddha. It said, uh, it predicted Lord Buddha's appearance 3,000 years before he appeared. It, it said what province he would appear in, what his father's name would be, and everything about him. And uh, it, if, you're not a, if you're not mentioned in the scriptures, then you're not a real, 
a real incarnation. You know, there's a lot of people that say, I'm God, you know, I'm moving the sun, I'm moving the moon. And then they get a toothache and they have to go to the dentist. So they're not really God. If anyone claims to be God, they are dog, not God. So we have 10 more minutes left here. Um, you want to read the second paragraph, uh, Melissa? The twigs of the tree are considered to be the sense objects. By development of the different modes of nature, we develop different senses. And by the senses, we enjoy different varieties of sense objects. The tips of the branches are the senses, the ears, nose, eyes, etc., which are attached to the enjoyment of different sense objects. The twigs are sound, form, touch, and so on. The sense objects, the subsidiary roots are attachments and aversions, which are byproducts of different varieties of suffering and sense enjoyments. The tendencies towards piety and impiety are considered to develop from the secondary roots, which spread in all directions. The real root from the Brahma Loka and the other roots are in the human planetary systems. After one enjoys the results of virtuous activities in the upper planetary systems, he comes down to, uh, to this earth and renews his karma or fruitive activities for promotion. This planet of human beings is considered the field of activities. Yeah, so you can go up or you can go down. You can go to the higher planets like Brahma Loka where you can live a long time. The people on Brahma Loka, Brahma himself, you know how long he lives, Alan? <laughs> It'll blow your mind. He, he lives one day, we'll say is one million to a billion years. It's four billion years, one day. So he actually lives for, a, uh, you know, uh, uh, 365 days. His night is the same duration. And then he lives for 100 years. So he lives for th 311 trillion with a T years. And right now, he in this particular universe, there's millions of Brahmas all over. And this is a very small universe. So he only has four heads. But there are 10-headed Brahmas, 100-headed Brahmas, 10,000-headed Brahmas. But he he uh, he's about halfway through his life right now. So he's about 350 trillion years old. And uh, he he, uh, he was having a midlife crisis after after Krishna appeared. He said, "Man, I could have been a coward boy, but I blew it. You know, I was like a big creator. I wanted to create the universe, and and I just blew it." So he knew that Lord Chaitanya would appear like four thousand five hundred years later, which is only like forty five minutes for him. And uh, he he. Uh, he said, look, you know, he prayed to Lord Chaitanya and Lord Chaitanya came and said, yeah, what do you want, Brahma? And he said, you know, please allow me to be part of your pastimes. I've wasted half my life. He was having a midlife crisis. And he, he said, OK, Brahma, you're going to appear. You'll be known for chanting the holy name of Krishna. And I am going to make all the demigods drunk with the holy name and you'll be there. And then he disappeared and Brahma fell on the ground crying. And so that's what happened, you know. But, uh, you know, when I heard this story from Varshana Maharaj, you heard Varshana, I sent you the video. I heard that from him like 35 years ago. And it's amazing all the stuff that he knows that I've never read. I've read all of Prabhupada's books, but he reads much more than I have, uh, you know, because he's been around a lot longer and is, is like a scholar, you know. Not only that, he has very deep understanding of all these scriptures. But, uh, you know, just the time scale of the Vedas is amazing. So um, we have six minutes and nine seconds left here. I'll just read this, uh, the Sanskrit. I'm not going to go through the uh, word for word. Narupam ashyeha tato palabhyate nato nachadir nacha sampratista ashvatamayanam Suviruda Mulam Asanga Shastrena Dridhena Chitva Tata Param Tat Param Margitadvyam Yasmin Gatana Nevartanti Buya Tam Eva Chadyam Purusham Prapadye Yata Praviti Prasrita Parani Translation The real form of this tree cannot be perceived in this world. 
No one can understand where it ends, where it begins, or where its foundation is. But with determination, one must cut down this strongly rooted tree with a weapon of detachment. Thereafter, one must seek that place from which, having gone, one never returns, and there surrender to that supreme personality of Godhead from whom everything began and from whom everything has extended since time immemorial. Go ahead, Melissa. It is now clearly stated that the real form of this banyan tree cannot be understood in this material world, since the root is upwards. The extension of the real tree is at the other end. When entangled with the material expansions of the tree, one cannot see how far the tree extends, nor can one see the beginning of this tree. Yet one has to find out the cause. I am the son of my father. My father is the son of such and such person, etc. By searching in this way, one comes to Brahma, who is uh, generated by the Garbha Dhaka Sai Vishnu. Finally, in this way, when one reaches the Supreme Personality of Godhead, that is the end of research work. One has to search out the origin of this tree, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, through the association of persons who are in knowledge of that Supreme Personality of Godhead. Then by understanding, one becomes gradually detached from this false reflection of reality, and by knowledge, one can cut off the connection and actually become situated in the real tree. Now, Alan, you were talking about fire, right? Yes, I so enjoy fire. Fire is one of the material elements. There's this, this material world is divided into 24 different elements. There's uh, the basic gross elements are earth, water, fire, air, intelligence, mind, and false ego. So these are the material elements. Some are more subtle and some are more gross. But that is the basis of the material world. But all of these have its origin in the Supreme Personality of God. He is, he is the origin of everything material. So he uses these different uh, material products in the process of sacrifice. Like we have fire sacrifices and we pour ghee into the flames. And that is like uh, an offering to Krishna. And the flame is like the, the, the tongue of God and fire is his mouth. But, you know, all everything can be used in Krishna's service. If you use everything in Krishna, Krishna Prabhupada said that you can use everything. You can use typewriters, dictaphones. He used a dictaphone to create all this literature and, you know, bombs, whatever it is, you can use it in Krishna's service as long as it's desired by Krishna. So that, um, but these things are coming from Krishna and the way that they're created is fascinating, you know. You know, the, there's different successive stages. They all come from an original source, uh, and like the Pradhan, which is like a, a subtle form of the material nature. And then all these things are divided first from the subtle form and then into the more gross forms, uh, you know, from earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and ego. It starts out from ego. And then and then from there comes, you know, the 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 mind. And then from the mind comes you know, there's the different uh, ether, ether is like, you know, the, the subtle thing, it's, it's in the um, space, and then air, and from air comes water, and from water comes fire, from fire comes earth, and earth contains all of the different elements. But that's the way the material world is made, you know, and the, the Vedas, if you understand the Vedas, you understand exactly how the earth, how everything was created, where it comes from, and understand our position in the universe. Why don't you read the last, actually, I don't know if we have time here. Uh, why don't you read the last one real, well, actually, there's less than one minute. So I'm sorry I'm yapping so much, but we'll, we'll stop here and continue uh, next time, okay? So thank nice you. Nice meeting you, Alan. Thank you very Thanks, much for you. participating, Alan. I appreciate it. And come and visit tomorrow if you can. Come to the program tomorrow in Lawrenceville. Can you can you text me with Tom again? Yeah, I'll text you all the information. Yeah, I'll, I plan. I'll come. Yeah, take bring your <coughs> excuse me. Bring your sister if you can. Uh, I'll try it soon. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, we're having a little. Uh, that's why I'll come. Or I'll tell you in person. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe later when things you know are a little bit more favorable. Yeah.